go. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for author uh, Barry Van Dusen, who was recently recognized by the Mass Center for the Book as one of Massachusetts' must-read authors of the year. Uh, Barry is here to discuss his uh, latest book, Finding Sanctuary, an artist explores the nature of Mass Audubon. Over the course of four and a half years, nature artist Barry Van Dusen visited all 61 of Mass Audubon's public wildlife sanctuaries, nature centers, and museums, producing drawings and paintings at each location. Follow his travels and share in his adventures from the islands of Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket to the mountain peaks of the Berkshires. Learn about hatching turtles on Cape Cod, rare orchids in the Connecticut River Valley, and a bear encounter in, western, in a Western Massachusetts forest. Birders, naturalists, conservationists, gardeners, artists, art appreciators, and all outdoor folks will enjoy this presentation. So Barry W. Van Dusen is an internationally recognized wildlife artist living in central Massachusetts. His articles and paintings have been featured in Bird Watchers Digest, Birding, and Yankee Magazines. And he has illustrated a variety of natural history books and pocket guides in association, in association with the Massachusetts Audubon Society. Uh, Barry was elected a full member of London Society of Wildlife Artists. His work has been exhibited regularly in the prestigious Birds in Art exhibition, as well as in many galleries in the US and Europe. Uh, at the invitation of the Artists for Nature Foundation, Barry has traveled to Spain, Ireland, England, Israel, India, and Peru, working alongside other wildlife artists to raise money for conservation of threatened habitats. Uh, so all uh, nearly 200 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Barry <laughs> for joining us here this evening. And Barry, you can take it away. Thanks so oh, much. Thank you, Robert. And thank you for all the work you've done to put this together. I'm certainly pleased to be here tonight. And I'm really gratified by the, uh, the large group we've got watching us here tonight. So I think we're going to have some fun. Um, I'll get right going with my, with my PowerPoint here. And I uh, hope you enjoy the program. I will answer some questions afterwards if you have them. So uh, let's get started. In the last decade or so, I've been involved in a number of artist in residence programs around New England. Uh, you know, most people think uh, artist in residence uh, is, is a situation where you go and you actually stay in the place where you're doing the work. And I guess that was the original intent and a lot of artist residencies do work that way. But of the ones I've been involved in, I've only actually stayed at the location in one of these residencies. That was the one at the Coastal Maine Botanic Gardens in Booth Bay, Maine, where they put me up in a great little cottage on the Sheepscot River. The rest of them are situations where I would, uh, I would actually commute from my home, uh, my studio in Princeton, Massachusetts, to a location over a period of time. I'd go repeatedly to those locations to work. An artist in residence can be a lot of different things. Of course, I'm a painter or an, a graphic, you know, a visual artist, but it can be a writer, it can be a musician, photographers. Uh, when I was uh, doing a residency up at the Booth Bay Gardens up in Maine, they had uh, several, uh, uh, several artists in residences come in through the course of that summer. And the residents before me were building a birch bark canoe like you see here in the, the lower right here. When I'm looking for a place to do a residency, I want an area which, uh, or a property which has a lot of natural areas uh, that I can explore with trails and so forth, because I'm a nature artist. I, I deal with uh, nature subjects. Uh, so um, I'm looking for places that where I can get outside and, and do uh, and work from natural subjects. Uh, this was the first residency project I took part in at Fruitlands Museums. And I did a lot of work out on the, they have a lovely uh, property on, on a hillside overlooking the Still River Valley than Harvard. And uh, I got involved in uh, uh, some of the uh, historical and cultural uh, uh, subjects there on the site as well. This farmhouse you see in the picture here is uh, Bronson Alcott's, uh, the farmhouse where Bronson Alcott had a transcendental community in the 1840s. He was the father of Louisa May Alcott. And that was the uh, one of the original buildings there on, on the location there at Fruitlands. 
I've found that botanic gardens are wonderful places for residencies. You know, gardens, there's always things happening in gardens. Uh, um, you know, plants are coming in, coming into bloom. Uh, new birds and insects and butterflies are coming and going, arriving, uh, especially through the summer months. So, um, and also most botanic gardens have a cultivated area where you can work with the cultivated plants. And they have wild areas around the garden, usually with trails. So I had the option of working with, uh, uh, you know, in the in the woodlands around the this is the Booth Bay, uh, the Booth Bay property, I could work in the woodlands around the garden, or I could go into the garden itself and work with some of the cultivated subjects. The thing I like the most about these residency projects is that they get me outdoors on a regular basis. You know, I've had uh, parts of my career, uh, moments in my career, times in my career when um, I'm spending, uh, you know, literally days on end in the studio working on like an illustration project for a bird book or something. And uh, to do a residency, that's that that's really a good excuse to get out regularly outside and do work outdoors, which is my favorite, one, probably one of the favorite things about the about uh, my my occupation. So, so I, uh, I really enjoy the residencies from that point of view, that they give me these opportunities. The most ambitious residency project that I've done is this most recent one for the uh, Massachusetts Audubon Society. And this was the original plan. I worked with Amy Montague at the Museum of American Bird Art in Canton. They were the official sponsor of my residency. And they wanted to do it originally in a year. They wanted me, uh, hoping I could go around to all the sanctuaries, where at least 45, I think, was the number of sanctuaries we were hoping to cover uh, in initially. Uh, but I told them, you know, a year is going to be too tight. I mean, if I was a photographer, yes, I could, I'm sure I could do that. But being an artist and, you know, going to each one of the sanctuaries and drawing and painting, I needed more time than that. So I asked for a two year working period. Well, uh, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but as it turned out, it took me four and a half years to visit all 61 of the Mass Audubon properties. Uh, but I was uh, obviously producing watercolors and, and drawings all along the way. I also uh, contributed after each uh, uh, sanctuary visit, I would uh, write, it, write that up for, for the, um, the uh, uh, museum blog. And also uh, there was plans, of course, to have the, uh, the, the paintings, the original paintings on exhibit at the, at the museum in 2017. A little bit about the Mass Audubon sanctuary system. Uh, there are, uh, when I started the project, there were 57 public properties. There's now 61. Uh, and these properties vary. Uh, some of them are staffed sanctuaries. So you have a nature center, you have uh, naturalists, uh, you have teachers that are working with children and adults, uh, you have ongoing programs. And then others of the sanctuaries are unstaffed and you're literally driving to a parking lot with a kiosk and, you know, maybe we can pick up a trail map and you can read about and, and, and head out on your own. Uh, most of the sanctuaries are like that. There's one nature camp that Mass Audubon runs up in New Hampshire, and I also included that in my in my project. So all in all, it's a lot of a lot of uh, um, a lot of acres of land preserved with this sanctuary system, over 35,000 acres. Um, the very first sanctuary was the Moose Hill Sanctuary in Sharon. Uh, established in 1916, so that, uh, that celebrated its 100th anniversary during the course of my residency. Uh, they vary a lot in size. The, uh, the Ipswich River Sanctuary up in the North Shore there is a uh, tops field is, uh, has over 12 miles of trails, whereas the smallest sanctuary in the Hunt Thicket uh, has um, only a quarter mile of trails. So you see some of these sanctuaries I literally could not cover in a full day. I mean, I couldn't walk all the trails and see all the things I, uh, I might have liked to on a sanctuary. Whereas some of the smaller sanctuaries I could cover in half a day. So I'd like to just ask you, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you, it sounds like most of you live in Massachusetts. Uh, and I'm sure there are uh, Mass Audubon properties near you. So how many of these have you visited? It, it's interesting to uh, always when I do this, uh, this in person, I love to have a show of hands. How many have seen, uh, how many have gone to six sanctuaries? How many people have gone to 12 sanctuaries? And it quickly drops out. And I myself, before I started this project, had probably only been to less than a dozen of the Mass Audubon sanctuaries. So this was a really great opportunity for me to see the other properties that Mass Audubon owned and operated. This was my scorecard 
for the for the sanctuary pro for this uh, for this uh, residency project, um, and you'll see that I, I've I've drawn some concentric circles here on this uh, on this map of Massachusetts. It shows all the Mass Audubon properties, uh, and uh, the little red dots mean that I had visited that one at this point in time. They're all they're all all the red dots all these. All the dots are red at this point, of course, um, but these concentric circles that you see here, uh, though they center on my home in Princeton, Massachusetts. Uh, so you can see I was centrally located in Princeton's, you know, right around in this area right in here. So I was more centrally located in Massachusetts, which meant that most of the sanctuary visits were like day trips from my from my studio in Princeton. I could get up in the morning, I could go to a sanctuary and be back at my studio by, by nightfall. However, when you get into the outer circles here, um, the, 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 those were situations where I needed to find accommodations. Sometimes I, I booked some hotel rooms. I had uh, I got put up by some volunteers and Mass Audubon, uh, um, uh, some friends of Mass Audubon that helped me out uh, when I was doing overnights. I would try to study up a little bit before I went to a sanctuary. Of course, I'm, I was always trying to maximize the time that I had at that sanctuary. So I would uh, I would get the sanctuary maps and I would read what I could about the sanctuaries and figure out you know what might be the most interesting uh, and, uh, and and what might give me the opportunities from good for good artistic exploration at these sanctuaries. And I would try to somewhat to plan my visits. And of course, uh, along with planning, I had to think about like seasonal uh, considerations. What season was it best to visit this particular sanctuary? And then, of course, just day to day, I was also concerned about the weather. You know, what kind of weather would I, what I need for, for, the, for, the, for a visit to that particular location? So there was some, some planning involved. This is the field kit that I carry to all of my sanctuary visits. Uh, this is a watercolor kit. Uh, watercolor is very popular among field artists because it's a very easy medium to take out into the field and use. The materials are very simple. Uh, it's very easy to clean up. It's very you can you know very you can pack things up in quite a compact manner. Uh, other some field artists do use other mediums like pastels and uh, different dry media or even uh, opaque paints. Um, um, some even use you know sculpture and that type of thing. But I would say by far watercolor the most popular medium. It's not to say that watercolor is the easiest medium to use because it's actually one of the more difficult mediums, but it's an easy medium to pack up and travel with. Uh, everything that you see here in my field kit fits into this uh, pack chair in the lower right. Uh, that also has straps so I can use it as a backpack. Uh, so I can carry this comfortably all day. Uh, this has this tripod mounted telescope has to be slung over my shoulder that I have to carry separately. Some of the other items I do carry a small digital camera that I can use in conjunction with the telescope for backup reference. I've got a uh, I carry a, a, a variety of different watercolor papers, different surfaces, um, a very smooth papers, um, cold pressed and rough papers for various different uh, subjects. I always carry a nine by 12 sketchbook. I'll talk a little more about that. And then of course, water and paper towels, um, pencils, that type of thing. Uh, this is a kit that I've honed down over the years. You know, when I started, first started doing this field work stuff, I carried a lot more than I needed to, which is typical. And then I've learned over, over, over the years exactly what I need to bring and what I can leave behind. When I first started the project, I thought I might do all of the paintings right there on, on the location at the various sanctuaries. But as I got into the project, there were so many subjects that I wanted to cover that I realized that was, uh, um, that really was, it wasn't really, I wasn't gonna be able to cover the variety of, of subjects that I wanted to in the brief time that I had at the sanctuaries. As it turned out, I probably painted about half of the paintings on location and uh, the rest of the paintings were done back in my studio using some of the reference I collected at the at the sanctuaries. This is at Wachusett Meadow Wildlife Sanctuary, which is the one that's nearest to my home in Princeton, Massachusetts. And I was doing a botanical study here, studies of a very tiny little spring ephemeral wildflower. And you can see a few blossoms right up here in this upper left hand corner uh, of, uh, of this picture. Uh, they're very tiny. This is hepatica. 
uh, tiny little flowers. And I literally was down on my belly uh, to paint these, uh, these hepatica. Here's a, uh, here's a enlarged, uh, here's the, 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 the finished painting of the hepatica. Some of the things I, I wanted to uh, explore with the painting are the various colors of these, of these, uh, these spring flowers. Uh, some of them were this lovely blue color, blue, blue violet. Some of them were pinkish. Others were a bright white. Also, if you'll notice, and this is typical of hepatica, the number of petals on the various blossoms varies. Uh, they don't all have the same number of petals. Those are the kind of things I love to, to study and, and, uh, and discover uh, when I'm working in the outdoors on these various subjects. Objects. I do paint with a telescope uh, in the field uh, when I'm getting into uh, birds and animals. Uh, and I have a tripod mounted telescope that I can work either from a sitting position or from a standing position. Uh, when I'm going to actually do some painting, uh, then I will set the tripod up in front of my little pack stool there and I'll spread my art materials out on the ground and I'll work in a sitting position. When I'm just simply doing pencil drawing, uh, collecting shapes and so forth, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll work from a standing position where I can throw the uh, tripod uh, over my shoulder and change position quickly if I need to. Uh, painting with a tripod, with a telescope and a tripod takes some getting used to, uh, but if you if you've done it long enough, it becomes very natural, and you almost forget that you're that you're looking through a telescope uh, to work with these subjects. One uh, um, one subject that bird artists and uh, and field artists love is a bird on a nest, uh, because birds, as you can imagine, one of the problems with birds is they're always often on the move. Sometimes some species, they seem like they're always on the move. But birds on a nest uh, stay in one place for long periods of time. They may leave the nest uh, for short periods, but they're usually right back there uh, shortly. And you can rely on them. You go to a, an, an active nest, you know that bird is going to be there or it soon will be. So these are situations I definitely looked for when I was uh, in any of my sanctuary visits. And if I found a bird on a nest, I, I, I tried to do uh, paintings on location of these birds. This is a heron colony in, um, in Groton, Massachusetts. And the nice thing about this particular heron colony is that the viewpoint is from a high rocky bluff above the colony. So from my vantage point up here on this rocky bluff, I was looking uh, at some of these uh, nests at eye level and some of them were even below eye level, which was a treat because you, normally when you're look, working at a heron colony, you're looking up at the nests and it's more difficult to get a good view of the birds. Almost all of the landscapes that I did for the uh, for the project were done on location. Of course, landscapes are very cooperative; they don't fly away. Uh, so uh, they're they're a subject that I could you know I could definitely plan on setting up somewhere and finishing a painting on location. Uh, when I was going to do a a new one, I knew I was going to do a landscape painting. I would often bring on this uh, this portable watercolor easel. Uh, and this is this is a, um, a a simple little contraption you can clamp a watercolor book to, uh, or a watercolor block, uh, and you can set it up and you can stand as you're doing the painting. You can stand at the easel, which I really enjoy doing. I love standing at a at a at an easel doing a painting. It gives your arm a little more freedom of movement. You get a little more gestural uh, movement to the brushwork. So I really enjoy doing that. However, it is one more piece of equipment, and as you can see, I was already carrying quite a bit of equipment on these projects. It was only when I knew I was going to do a landscape that I would lug this along as well. It's best if you're doing landscape paintings to work in the shade, uh, to not have your, your paper that you're painting on in the bright sun. That can be very misleading. It can really, you can often misjudge the tones of the painting if, you're, if, you're, if your support is in the bright sun. Uh, I've, uh, in my early days, I would do a painting in the bright sun and you bring it indoors and it was very, very dark when you get indoors because uh, you've misjudged those values. So it's always best to work in, in the shade when you're doing landscape landscape painting and you know a lot of landscape painters know this that's why you see those those classic uh, uh, photographs of people like John Sargent with all those umbrellas you know st uh, placed around him while he was doing these these outdoor watercolors uh, it's to control the the light falling on the um, on his surface while he was painting I started this painting this is a drumlin farm in Lincoln and I started this painting sitting on this rock that you see here and I was looking down onto the the fields of the uh, of the of the uh, uh, drumlin farm 
farm CSA project, community supported agriculture project that they have there in Lincoln. But as I was working, the sun came around and sure soon enough I'm in bright sun and I had to move back into the shade uh, to continue my painting. So you see, that's what I've done. I've moved back into the shade. Here's the final painting. Uh, not very many of my sanctuary paintings have people in them. This is one of the few that does actually include some people. I'm not great at people. Uh, so um, I, I, you won't find me doing a lot of people. Um, uh, but uh, this one, there was, uh, there was um, uh, tours of the CSA operation going on and a little tractor would come down the hill from, from headquarters and uh, drop off groups of people and they would, they would uh, take a tour of the CSA and then go back in the tractor. So I, I caught a bunch of them out here in the field on tour. I want you to look at the greens in this painting. I spend a lot of time um, uh, working with, with uh, variations of greens in my, in my summer landscapes. You know, the, the summer landscape in New England can be almost monotonously green. I mean, you look out there and that's all you see in high summer is just green. Uh, but green can have a lot of variety to it. And I deliberately do not carry any green pigments in my watercolor box. I mix all of my greens from combinations of blues and yellows. I use a few other pigments too for some special greens like burnt sienna and ivory black. But um, what I'm doing is I'm, I, I'm, I'm really adjusting the color temperature of the greens by mixing them from those, from those components. You'll see some of the greens in my painting are very uh, warm and yellowish. Others are very, uh, very cool and bluish. And it's that variety of greens that, that makes the, uh, the painting come alive. And I push the variations that I see of greens in summer to create that interest and that variety. Another thing about painting on location, um, a lot of it is learning to edit what you see and what you transcribe into your painting. You've got to figure out what do I leave in and what do I leave out? Uh, and, um, and that's something that just takes time um, and something you learn to do uh, with experience. Uh, this, uh, at this particular location out in Barrie, Massachusetts, I was painting along the edge of a canyon called Cook's Canyon, very steep drop off down to a little, a little into a ravine and a river. Uh, and I took a photograph of the scene just as it looked to me as I was painting it. And look at the things I did to change the scene uh, in my painting. One thing you'll notice right away, I got rid of all this foliage in the foreground, which was, uh, which was very distracting. It wasn't doing anything for the picture. It was really cluttering things up. Got rid of that. Uh, these rocks, I played those up uh, so that they're, they make a more dramatic foreground here. Another thing I did is I lightened the whole background, the woods in the background. And that made this profile of the canyon come out, this profile here that you see, come out very strongly against the background, made a much more dramatic picture. So these are the kind of things that uh, on location you, you, you learn to, to change. Uh, you're the master of, your, of, of, of drawing and painting, and you can make these changes. Uh, a photographer might have a little more trouble doing this, but artists uh, can make these changes freely. And uh, I always encourage my students to feel free to make these changes. This is part of what of the joy of being an artist is the ability to make these changes to what you see and to enhance your expression uh, uh, and, and, and make the most of it. Oftentimes I would start a painting in the field and then conditions would change in such that uh, I wasn't able to finish the painting on the spot. So what I would do is I would get what I call a good field start. This was down on Cape Cod, Barnstable, midsummer, early morning. Uh, a very, very, what was going to be a very, very hot day uh, there on the Cape. And the humidity was unbelievable. It was just uh, really, really humid that morning. And I, I, I got down to the, uh, this overlook of the marsh there in Barnstable. This is the Barnstable Great Marsh. Uh, and I started a painting. I put down the first layers of wash and they just sat there soaking wet. Nothing was drying. And um, I waited for a while and hoping that, you know, these washes would dry because my painting, in my painting technique, the painting technique that I use with landscapes, there's a lot of glazing involved. And that means you have to let a layer of paint dry completely. And then you can put another layer of paint over it. 
Uh, well, that just wasn't going to happen. So I basically gave up and put it on, out in the sun to dry. And, and uh, I took some photographs of the scene that I could use later in the studio. And I wandered down to, into the marsh and I got involved in some other projects, some other subjects. Uh, there's a little flower down there that I started working with and some rushes. So I, pick, I, I, I finished this painting in the studio. All in all, though, the, the start is still very important. I feel like uh, I've, I've, I've got the, uh, I, I've, I've nailed down the design. I've had to figure out where the elements are going in the picture, uh, where the horizon's going to be, where, where my uh, focal points are going to be. So I've done a lot of the work there with this, uh, as, uh, with this start that I've done. And I've also started to establish some of the tones and colors. So in the studio, these, these starts can actually uh, lead the way into completing the picture. They kind of lead you along if you've made those good decisions to begin with. And it's much better than either rushing the project or trying to, uh, what artists call, chase the light. If the light changes, they try to change their picture too. And then you get into a real mess. So you want to avoid that. When I am working with uh, small uh, birds, uh, or animals, uh, then I am more likely to work in a sketchbook and try to nail down some of the characteristic shapes and poses of the various species. And those are the things that I can use later in the studio. And sometimes I'll even use a pose in my sketchbook. I'll redraw it in the field and use it right, uh, right in the field. Um, along with recording these shapes of these animals that you see here, I was always all, also keeping track um, of the different species that I was seeing at the various sanctuaries. You can see a list down here on the right hand side of my sanctuary pages. And I was keeping track of not only birds, but plants and insects and other animals that I was seeing and making random notes about what was happening. So the sketchbooks become be kind of, kind of a journal and I depended upon them when I got back to my studio and, and needed to write up the, uh, the sanctuary visit. Another thing I use my sketchbooks for is for doing what an artist call thumbnail sketches. And this is a situation where I'm, I wanna do a, a landscape painting, but I wanna figure out exactly what the design is gonna be uh, of the painting. And I wanna figure out you know, where, the, where the focal points are gonna be, where the horizon is gonna be. I wanna figure out how I'm gonna crop the landscape. I mean, you go outside, the landscape goes forever in, in every direction. You've got to figure out what portion of the landscape you want to include. You, you might decide you want to move elements around in the landscape. And that's what I start to work out in these little thumbnail sketches. And these are very brief. They don't take very long. They're only about five inches across. So I do these very quickly with a soft pencil. Uh, and then I use those as a general guide to get into the, the landscape painting. I did, do, I did do a landscape painting of this subject of Broadmoor and Natick, and it's in the book. I will uh, lift um, subjects out of my sketchbook uh, uh, directly and then use them in the studio, uh, in a studio painting. This was a field sparrow up at Rocky Hill in a power line cut up at Rocky Hill in uh, Witherod shrubs. And you can see I got some nice poses here, but I really like this pose here that I caught in my sketchbook. So I took that and I, I'll take the I'll take the my sketchbook and I'll put it on my scanner and I'll actually make make copies from my sketchbook. I can enlarge them or reduce them, and then I can I can put those uh, on a light table and trace those with the uh, with a light table onto a piece of watercolor paper and uh, do the finished painting. So I'll often lift subjects right out of my sketchbooks and use them in finished paintings in the studio. But a lot of time what I'm doing when I'm drawing is I'm really learning about the subject. It's my way of learning about a particular plant or animal. Uh, this is what uh, bi biologists call uh, morphology, the, the form and structure of, of living organisms. And that's what, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm concentrating on when I'm out working in my sketchbooks, the morphology of these living things. Uh, and the more you draw a, a subject uh, from various angles, the better you get to know it. And just the act of drawing the intensity that it takes to see the shapes, to draw the shapes accurately, that gets hardwired in, into the brain and it stays there. And then when I'm back in the studio and I want to treat that subject, I can draw on those, those, those experiences of, of drawing that, uh, that, that animal in the field. So some of these sketches may, you know, may never become a painting in my studio. They're simply my way of exploring nature and recording what I see. So these sketches are literally an end in, them, in themselves. 
I want to talk about um, a little bit about the the act of going through a, a field painting and how it differs from a photograph. And one of the ways I think is because you're you're with a subject for a period of time when you're doing a drawing and a painting of something. It takes time. It takes much more than a millisecond, uh, which is you know a photograph is is simply a very very fr tiny frag fraction of time. But when you're drawing something, you're with a subject for a good deal of time, and you're you're, you're smelling things, you're hearing things, you're you're watching the light do different things. You're watching the animals go through different types of behavior. So you're taking in a lot in the course of the time that you're working on a drawing or painting. Uh, this was down at Sampson's Island in Ketuit, which is a bird nesting colony. And uh, of course, here again, bird on a nest. All right, always looking for those. So these are great subjects. These least terns were sitting on nests in this bird colony. They allowed me to land on the island. I'll talk a little bit more about, about that later, but I could land on the island and I set up to do this uh, drawing uh, and, and make it into a painting of a least turn on a nest on the open beach there. And I started the drawing of the turn on a piece of watercolor paper with my 3B pencil. And as I was working, I noticed that there was an eggshell and it was quite close to the bird. And I and so I, I moved that into a better position in my drawing, you know, erased a little bit and added the, added the eggshell there. I also noticed that the eggshell had this you know pinkish membrane, uh, so that uh, so I, I realized this was probably a very recently hatched egg. Well, I kept drawing away and working out the details of the bird in the background, and sure enough, the bird sort of started shuffling around on the nest, and a chick popped out from the the, the breast feathers of of the adult bird. And right away, I took my eraser and scrubbed away that part of the, the bird's breast and added the, added the chick in there. So over the course of the drawing, you know, good thing I hadn't added paint at that point, but over the course of the drawing, uh, I made these changes as, as I was seeing and experiencing these new things about the scene. So very different from a photograph, a, a field painting can be a real, a real combination or a compilation of moments that I'm observing in the field. I'll often uh, gra uh, gather a lot of different types of references to bring back home uh, and to work at in my studio. This is Laughing Brook out in Hamden. Uh, Laughing Brook was uh, a favorite haunt of the author uh, Thornton Burgess, who wrote a bunch of a, a, a very popular children's stories years ago. And this he lived right near this brook here, and he was the one who, who coined it, uh, Laughing Brook. Uh, he uh, wrote the, I think his first uh, novel was The Old Mother West Wind, and Peter Rabin and all these characters, I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. This was where, this is where he lived and worked. Uh, so I was there in summer, and you can see the water was rather low. So I was able to walk right out into the gravel bars in the river and set up my little pack chair. And I could gaze down into the, the pools of the, the slow pools of water in the stream and look at all the, the animals that lived in the stream. The thing that really fascinated me uh, were these, uh, these strange geometric uh, shadows of the water striders. Um, really kind of odd shadows, uh, very graphic. Uh, they're much more prominent than the animal itself. You hardly see the striders, but their shadow is very obvious on the stream bed. So I did some work with those. I also noticed these, these small fish, these uh, which were, um, I later learned were black-nosed dace, a very common minnow that lives in streams around Massachusetts and New England. So I was just making a note of all these things, not really sure what I would do with them, but just enjoying seeing them and learning about them. I took some photographs as well. Uh, and these are very handy when I'm back in the studio for various, like the color and the textures of the rocks, for example. Uh, and also a very important thing that you've, you've got to be aware of is the scale. Uh, between the various uh, the, uh, subjects that you're working with. What's the scale between the water strider and the minnow? So I tried to get some photographs of both of those animals uh, in one shot so I'd be able to, to, to uh, you know, get a sense of the scale. Those are things all very important to, uh, uh, to putting together the painting in the studio. So then I'll take my, my sketchbook, like I said, and I make some, make some photocopies and enlarge and reduce them. And I took a piece of just, just regular, you know, bond paper uh, and cut these, cut these uh, um, copies up and started moving them around on this sheet of paper to try to get a nice balance between these various shapes uh, on, the, on the sheet of paper to make a pleasing and a balanced composition. This is what I call sort of the design phase of doing 
doing a studio painting. And this 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 particular uh, piece is what I would call the working drawing, and it is literally that. I just you know I don't I literally destroy these things afterwards. There's no reason to keep them because they are just a tool for me to use. Uh, for completing the painting. And then that working drawing may go on a light table and I may trace that, trace the elements there and put it together. And here's the, uh, the final watercolor of the, uh, the dace and the, and the water striders at, um, at Laughing Brook. So all those different references coming together that way in the studio. One thing that, re that I realized was happening as I got into the, the sanctuary visits is that sometimes I wouldn't think about a good idea for a picture until after the sanctuary visit. You know, I'd go, go home at night that night and I'd lay in bed and I'd think, wow, I saw that and wow, wouldn't, gee, that's a great idea for a picture. I could make that into a painting. And that was the case here at the, uh, um, at the uh, Kettle Island Reserve, one of Mass Audubon's reserves up on the North Shore. Uh, and I was working uh, from the Coolidge Reservation, which is actually a trustee's property, but you can see Kettle Island from this, this ocean lawn that they have there on the Coolidge Reservation. And it was, it was November, it was early November. The sun was low because at that time of year, the sun's getting low. And I was looking right at the ocean and the sun was coming right at me. And these birds flew in and landed in this grassy area in front of me. And I realized they were snow buntings. A little early for snow buntings, uh, but I was delighted, you know, I said, oh, this is gonna be, I'd love to, I'd love to work with these birds. So I did some pages in my sketchbook, uh, basically looking for the shapes and the patterns of the birds. But I also did make some written notes about this effect of light that I was seeing, this backlit effect that I was seeing. And the birds were, uh, the birds' bodies were being thrown into shadow because the light was behind them. And they, were ha they had these sort of glowing halos around their shape that you can see uh, in this, uh, this, uh, this test painting that I did. I'll often do a smaller painting to just sort of test out an idea before I get into a larger sheet and try a more, more complex design. So this is my test painting. And in the course of doing that, you know, I'm working with the colors and the patterns. I also noticed if I stack the birds against each other, that sort of halo uh, effect comes out even stronger. So I'm going to play that up even more when I get into my studio painting. So I'll take you through the steps of doing the painting. Here's the very first washes that I laid down for the, the, the larger painting in the studio of the snow buntings. And you can see how I played up one, you know, the bird shapes against each other to get those, those nice uh, sort of glowing halos on the bird. Uh, you might notice also that those, those shadows look pretty darn dark, don't they? I mean, they look, geez, you know, did he get it a little too dark? These are white birds we're talking about here, white birds, okay? Um, did I get it a little too dark? And I'm wondering that myself, you know, but I, you know, I've, I've used watercolor a lot. I know that those first washes that I put down, I have to make them a little bit darker than I think I need to, because that white paper, that contrast with the white paper is making them look darker than they really are. So here's the second stage. Okay, now I've added some background tones and colors. Uh, and you can see already that those shadows, they don't look quite as dark, do they? You can almost imagine now that I'm, I'm painting light or white, white birds now, okay, as, the, as the, the tones start to come together. Getting rid of that, that blinding white of the sheet of paper makes a big difference in starting to judge the tones. And then the only, the only step left here really was to paint the patterns of plumage on the birds themselves. Uh, you know, the, 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 the markings on the back and the chest. And now you really can see how they really do look uh, like white. Well, I hope you think they do look like white birds here against that strong backlight. This is called Wings of Winter. So these are the, the kind of differences I see between a location a, a painting done on location and a painting done in the studio. You know, on location, uh, you're, you're working in a very intuitive way. You're reacting to things as they happen. Um, you know, you're improvising certain things as you go along. Uh, and then studio painting can be much more uh, conceptual. You can have an idea that you want to translate into a painting, really think things out. You can deal with more complicated designs like I did with the water striders and dace. You, know, you can balance the parts. Uh, so a, a very 
very different kind of processes, but I enjoy both of them. I enjoy doing the outdoor work and the studio work. Um, and I think in a lot, in a, in a lot of ways, they, they inform each other as well. I think, I think they can, they can, you know, I think they draw on each other, your experience in doing these two types of painting. And I, I, would, I always want to be doing both, both types of work. I did some larger paintings for the for the residency. Uh, watercolors do get more difficult as they get larger in size, and that's because well, when you're when you're using watercolor in a in a sort of a loose manner the way I do, you're laying down large areas of of, of damp you know and wet paint, and then you have to manipulate manipulate those in various ways as they go through different stages of drying. So it's, it's a very time sensitive medium. You haven't got a lot of time to work with a wet wash before, it's, before it starts to dry. So as those washes get larger on a larger sheet, they get more difficult to handle. So I typically with my field paintings, I don't work much larger than like a quarter sheet of, of, of watercolor paper. But in the studio, I'll work much larger. Uh, this is uh, this this particular painting came from a uh, a some sketches I did of a tree up at Lake Wampanoag in Gardner. It was a, a black spruce uh, that had been worked over heavily by a, a pileated woodpecker, and I didn't see the woodpecker at the time. And that's very common. You're walking through the woods, you see these incredible these incredible holes that these pileated woodpeckers make in these trees. And of course, the woodpecker's nowhere around, but you know the woodpecker has been there. <laughs> so I did some careful studies of these. I love the color of the inner bark and the inner flesh of the tree there and how it contrasted with the bark. So really took some careful color notes. And then back in the studio, I took some previous references that I had done of pileated woodpeckers. And they are a fairly common bird where I live in Princeton. We've seen, we see them a lot. And I was able to add that uh, to, the, um, uh, to the tree trunk for the finished painting. This is the largest uh, painting I did for the residency. This is almost a full sheet of watercolor paper. And it's this one I think kind of straddles the line between an indoor and an outdoor painting because what I've done here is I've collected specimens from nature. Uh, this was a sanctuary up on the North Shore at Endicott, Endicott Center. And uh, on their drive going in, there was it was it was winter time, or I'm not sure whether it was, but anyway, there was it was an off season, so there were a lot of dried weeds along the entrance road there, and I collected a lot of these weeds. Now, out of Mass Audubon Sanctuary, if you read the kiosk, they tell you please don't collect the plants, and uh, I had to make sure that you know I wasn't setting a bad example for anyone, and of course I made sure I didn't pull any rare plants up. And I knew what the plants were, uh, generally speaking, so I wasn't collecting any rare or endangered plants. So I collected uh, a number of weeds there along the drive and brought them home. And I was thinking of doing this, this large painting, of really rendering the, 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 the lovely shapes and colors of these, of these winter weeds. I started by putting a, that big sheet of watercolor paper on my drawing board and just taking the, the, wind, the stems and moving them around, uh, working with the natural curvature of the weeds and so forth to create a pleasing uh, design. And then I started you know, one by one, just doing doing contour drawings of the weeds, careful dr pencil drawings, and then adding the color. It took me probably almost a week to do to do this painting. So I spent much longer on it than I would on a typical field painting or a smaller watercolor. Here's the finished painting, which I called Seeds of Promise. And I'll show you some details because it really is all about the details with a painting like this. Uh, subtle colors. Um, I knew what most of these uh, plants were, although one of them I had to look up, it ended up being purple loosestrife, which is something that was a good thing I did pull that. They would be, they would be happy I did because that's an invasive, <laughs> an invasive plant. But this was all about really studying the plants very, very carefully. You can learn a lot about botany just by really looking very carefully and drawing and painting the specimens from life like this. And it's, it's very relaxing too. I find it's a, in, in the controlled environment of the studio. It's a pleasant experience. Now, I think most um, most birders in New England or in Ma and in Massachusetts, I think would probably agree with me when I say that mid-May is like the high point of the, the birding year in Massachusetts. That's when the greatest number uh, and variety of very colorful and striking birds are moving through our state on migration. And uh, because of that, when I, you know, I would, pack in a lot of sanctuary visits during that 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 May that mid-May season. 
but still I, I, I couldn't keep up with all the birds that were coming through. There's just so much happening so quickly. I did a few paintings with a full background like you see here. This is a Wilson's warbler up at Nahant Thicket. And you can see I worked out all the vegetation and so forth around the bird. But I couldn't do that with every bird I was seeing. There just wasn't time for that. So what I did was I went out and I bought some of these uh, Stillman and Byrne uh, sketchbooks that are loaded with watercolor paper. They're actually watercolor books, good quality watercolor paper. And uh, I determined I'd do a series of just birds that really, I mean, uh, sketches or paintings that really highlighted just the bird itself and not get too involved in the background so that I could spend more time doing all this wonderful variety of birds that were moving through. Um, now, uh, I think here again, a lot of birds would agree with me that in the springtime, probably the, the, the group of birds that people are really giving their most attention to are the wood warblers uh, in spring and mid-May, the eastern wood warblers, a, a diverse group, a, a wonderful group with very colorful, um, wonderful, you know, distinctive songs, which you can learn. Uh, they're just a wonderful group. And, and I'm first to say they're one of my very favorite groups of birds to work with. And you'll see a lot of warblers in my book for that reason. Uh, but I just want, thought I'd ask you, see if you can identify these birds. A lot of these are very common, uh, common uh, woodland birds here in New England, birds that, you know, if you look for them, you can find them. So let's go through some of the, the wood warblers that I saw in the spring migrations during the residency project. This is one of the most beautiful uh, uh, Eastern wood warblers. Most of the warblers I'm gonna show you are the males of the species. Those are the ones that are most brightly colored. And of course, at this time of year in the spring, they're also in full breeding plumage. So they're, the, they're, at, that, they're at their very brightest uh, at this time of year as well. Um, anyone recognize this? It's a Blackburnian warbler. Uh, some, uh, some birders refer to this as a fire throat. This is an American red start. Oh, I should have said that right. I should have given you a few minutes, but this is an American red start, a very common uh, Eastern wood warbler. And this was done up at Marblehead Neck, up in Marblehead. And Marblehead Neck is one of those places that birders call a migrant trap. Uh, it's a promontory that sticks out into the Atlantic. It's got development all around it. Uh, and there's this little, this little wooded plot here. So in migration, when birds are moving up and down the coast, uh, in, if they stop to rest and feed, they're looking for these areas where they can, where they can rest up and find food. And so they concentrate in areas like this. Um, um, Mount Auburn Cemetery is another example of a, a migrant trap in spring here in, in uh, eastern Massachusetts. Uh, Halloween colors on this bird. They also have wonderful movement. They just little sort of barn dance kind of a movement where they oh, spread their tail and waggle it around. They're wonderful little birds to watch. A very aptly named chestnut sided warbler, a common wood warbler here in, the, in our area. This one is a little less common. Uh, most of the birds, most of the warblers I'm showing you are birds you could you could go out and find on a, a mid-May uh, morning. Uh, but these here are a little hit or, hit or miss. There's a few species of warblers that are a little less common. This is one of them. It's a bay-breasted warbler, and this was also at the uh, at the at the migrant trap at Marblehead Neck. Uh, Marblehead Neck is another. The Hunt Thicket and Marblehead Neck are both migrant traps up on the North Shore. Another male warbler, a pretty little warbler called a Nashville warbler. This is a Nashville warbler in spring. And finally, a you might you might recognize this one. Another fairly common uh, spring migrant. This is a male magnolia warbler, also up at the migrant trap up in Marblehead. And it's not unusual to see, you know, over a dozen species at these migrant traps on a morning in, in, in May in Massachusetts. And what a, what a treat it is. Just delightful. So there also are many other types of colorful birds moving through in May. I mean, you've got orioles, you know, and you've got rose-breasted grosbeaks, and you've got scarlet tanagers. So there's, so there's lots of real colorful, interesting birds moving through other than the warblers. Uh, now, some of these uh, birds, as they move through, uh, they will continue on their way and nest further north of us in Canada and the Maritimes. Others, uh, other species that I'm showing you will stay and nest here in, in Massachusetts. 
So see if you can name these birds. This is a, a small bird, like about the size of a warbler, but it's not a warbler. It's in a different family altogether. This is a blue-gray gnat catcher, and they love moist uh, forests, uh, like the maple forests at Eagle Lake in Holden, where I sketched and painted this bird. If you live near the coast, you might be formal, uh, more familiar with these birds. In coastal scrub, the understory of coastal woods, these birds are, can be quite common in summertime. This is what, when I was a kid, we called them rufous-sided towhees. Uh, these days, um, it's called an eastern towhee. Not all of them are bright and colorful, uh, and some can be um, quite sort of plain and consequently quite difficult to identify. This is a, a group of, of fly catchers, the Impidnox fly catchers, which uh, there's a number of different species and they all look very, very similar. Uh, you're more likely to identify them by their call notes, which, uh, which are more distinctive. Uh, but the clue here is the, the vegetation that the bird's in. You might uh, notice those slender, those very slender long slender leaves of willow. This is a willow flycatcher. Mass Audubon has a number of programs that promote and support uh, bird populations at their sanctuaries. And this can be something very simple like keeping the, the barn doors open on a barn so that barn swallows can fly in and out and establish their nests on, 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 on rafters and things like that. Uh, but it also can be a little more intensive, uh, such as the uh, 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 a, um, a chain of bluebird houses that a lot of sanctuaries put up. Nest boxes mounted on posts that are put in an open field to attract bluebirds or tree swallows also use these nest boxes. This is a bluebird up at Ipswich River in Topsfield. And you'll notice if you look closely, there's a ring there's a band on the leg of this bird. So I know this bird was one that the Ipswich River naturalists and, and biologists knew well because they had banded this bird. Of course, another part of, uh, of supporting a bird population is making sure that you maintain the habitat that they need uh, for nesting and, and raising families. And bobolinks nest in open fields. And uh, bobolinks are a group of birds that's been declining in New England for years, the grassland birds. Uh, you know, more and more of our grasslands are being converted to housing developments or they're being, or they're growing back up into forests. So we have fewer and fewer grassland areas. So, um, Mass Audubon uh, uh, encourages um, grassland owners to, to uh, adjust their mowing schedules so that these birds have a chance to raise their young and fledge their young before the, before the fields get mowed. Uh, so that's one of, the, uh, one of the programs that they're involved with for, uh, for grassland birds. This is Drumland Farm in Lincoln. And then of course, along the coast, there are special birds there that, uh, that nest on the open beaches. And of course the open beaches are places where, uh, where people love to go as well and walk their dogs and you know, ride their, their beach buggies and other vehicles on the beaches. So these birds often have a very difficult time nesting in areas where there's a lot of, a lot of uh, other disturbances on these beaches. So Mass Audubon, uh, uh, they, they, they locate where these critical uh, of nesting areas are, and then they protect these areas with fencing and descriptive signage. And in some cases, like here at Samson's Island in Cotuit, uh, Mass Audubon owns the island. So they, they simply shut down the whole island during the nesting season so that boaters can't land and people can't, uh, can't uh, you know, walk around on the, and disturb the nesting birds. Um, in Massachusetts, it's mostly uh, a, a number of species of terns that are the focus of these programs and also uh, the, the piping plover, which is the bird you see here in the lower left, a lovely little plover that nests on our beaches. Birds aren't the only thing that get attention at the Mass Audubon sanctuaries, of course. Uh, there's a very active program to support the population of diamondback terrapins at the Wellfleet Bay Sanctuary out, out in Wellfleet, Massachusetts. And I, when I was there for my project, when I was walking the trails, I would notice these enclosures that I would come across out on the sandy beaches there at Wellfleet. And those were there to mark the nests of diamondback terrapins. They have a group of volunteers that go out after the, after 
the turtles have come up onto the sand and dug their nests and they, the, the volunteers recognize where, where those nests are and they protect them with these enclosures and little flags to mark them so they won't be disturbed by people, but also so skunks won't dig them up and foxes and that type of thing. Uh, and then uh, later in the summer, when the when the turtles start to hatch, these same volunteers go out and they watch these nesting areas. And if the turtles start to hatch, they assist the young turtles in getting to protected areas before they are predated upon by uh, gulls. There's always lots of laughing gulls looking to pick off young turtles, um, foxes, raccoons, as I mentioned before. Uh, and they've done really well. The population of diamondback terrapins at Wellfleet Bay is doing really well. The, the year I was there, they had 85 active uh, terrapin nests that had hatched, and each one of them, each one of them produced, you know, like 12 to 20 uh, young turtles. So the population is doing very well there. A lot of uh, working with natural subjects in the field, of course, is putting your place, putting yourself in the right place at the right time. Uh, and this is this is really critical, especially for things like flowering plants, like you know unusual flowering plants. Uh, they're only going to flower for so long. Uh, and uh, I had a, um, a, a one of the Mass Audubon staff members, Ron Wallanen. He was the Western uh, Sanctuaries uh, uh, manager, uh, property manager, and he circulated among all of these Western uh, sanctuaries on a weekly basis. And uh, I got in touch with him, told him what I was doing, and and he'd call me up, you know, and let me know if something was going on that I might want to give my attention to like he called me up one Sunday night and he said well you know out at high ledges in Shelburne the the yellow lady slippers are coming into bloom now and he said it's going to be a hot week so you probably shouldn't put that off too long so I of course when I get a tip like that I dropped everything and went out there the next day and uh, painted these lovely uh, yellow lady slippers uh, from life there uh, in the in the forest there at high ledges in Shelburne really, really beautiful plants. It was a privilege to, to see and be able to work with them. Ron also put me onto these rare orchids at the, uh, at the West Mountain Sanctuary in Plainfield. And he told me exactly where to go. He even put, uh, I had to laugh because I got to the location, it was in a big wet meadow. And I parked my car where he, where he told me to next to a yellow mailbox or something, I don't, don't quite remember. But, and he said, look to your left. And I looked to my left and there were these little orange uh, flags, you know, the, 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 the little flags that you, that you mark plants with. And he had made a little string of those going out into the wet meadow. And I said, God bless Ron Wallan. And I followed the flags out and here and here with this colony of these beautiful uh, purple fringed uh, uh, orchids, um, stunning plants that I spent some time with. Standing in water while I was doing sketches and paintings with these plants, I did some, some of these follow-up paintings in the studio as well, but working, uh, working uh, I did had brought rubber boots because I knew I was going to be in water. But one of my boots sprang a leak and uh, of course uh, made a note to myself, time for a new pair of rubber boots after that day. I spent the rest of the day with wet feet. <laughs> you remember those things about these sanctuary visits, of course. Thought I'd just go through some of the subjects I worked with on the sanctuary projects. And of course, birds are not only my favorite subject, uh, but they're very accessible, easy, you know, easy to see and work with. Um, there is that problem of movement, of course, and their size, but uh, uh, but I, I'm, I've, I've done a lot of work with birds. Uh, um, they're, one, they're, they're something that I'm sort of known for. And I was working for the Museum of American Bird Art. They were my sponsor. So I certainly felt I could spend plenty of time with, with birds. <laughs> Common birds. Uh, you know, common birds can be some of the more difficult ones to paint uh, because you know what they look like and other people also know what they look like. And it's kind of like it's kind of like doing a painting of, of your mother or your uh, or your father or your wife. You know, you you know, if you don't if you haven't got it right, because, you know, the subject so well. Right. And it's kind of the same way with the with these very common birds. And then not so common birds too. These are what, what birders would call uh, good birds. You know, when you're out birding, you ask, uh, have you seen any good birds? And birders, you know, of course they're all good birds, <laughs> but uh, you know, birders uh, wanna see the, the more unusual birds when they're in an area. So, uh, and these were some of the ones that I did encounter. I didn't encounter any real um, greatly rare birds, I would say on, on the, the Mass Audubon Sanctuary, but that wasn't what this project was about anyway. But I did encounter some unusual birds. Uh, this is a kestrel a, uh, out at the uh, Acadia Sanctuary near the Connecticut River, beautiful male kestrel. 
up in the upper right here, this is a, a young male orchard oriole. Um, most of you are familiar with our um, uh, the northern oriole or the what used to be called the Baltimore oriole. This is a less common oriole species here in the northeast, although with climate change they're they're starting to move into our area. The uh, the young male looks quite different from the adult male too. So that that was the first time I had seen an, a a young male orchard oriole. I puzzled over what it was for a while, and then a, a winter wren uh, out in the Berkshires. Uh, lovely little birds. Uh, they have that jaunty little tail that they cock up and they've got a lovely song, a lovely long rambling song that fills the forest. I did work also with mammals at some of the sanctuaries. Some of the sanctuaries had farm animals, you know, so there's working farms uh, on some of the sanctuaries. And uh, of course, farm animals are great to work with. You don't need a telescope or binoculars. You can walk up to their enclosures, their fences, and you can, you know, work, uh, do plenty of work at naked eye. Uh, so those are those were those were uh, subjects that I enjoyed working with. And then wild mammals as well. Wild mammals are less accessible than birds, as most of you know. It's you know, it's lucky if you get a good look at a at a fox or a bobcat. Uh, very hard to predict that. But some mammals are very common, like the little chipmunk you see here. Uh, cute little things, but I'm sure a lot of you gardeners aren't very fond of these things. They can do really make a mess of your of your flower beds. <laughs> I worked with reptiles and amphibians at some of the sanctuaries. At uh, um, uh, Stony Brook in Norfolk, they have these lovely boardwalks that go out over the, these pond, these lily ponds. Uh, and there's these stumps that stick out of the pond. And, and that's where the turtles crawl up onto these stumps. And the kids are running up and down the boardwalks and, and pointing out the turtles and screen. And it's lots of fun. It's, it's turtle watching central there at, at Stony Brook. Uh, and I was watching these turtles that day. And I noticed that they were doing this thing where they were holding all their limbs up in the air, their, their, their front legs and their rear legs at times. They're holding them all up in the air and just resting on their lower shell or their plastrons. Uh, and I thought that was kind of unusual. Uh, and uh, uh, it was, it reminded me of a pose we do in my yoga class. Uh, so I called this painting um, turtle yoga. I asked some, bi uh, some biologists about this later and what's going on here. And some of them thought that th maybe they were exposing their limbs to, uh, to the sun and the air to, uh, um, to deter leeches. The off leeches often feed on the fleshy parts of turtles. But I think probably um, the, I think what was probably more likely is what they're doing is extending those fleshy parts uh, to absorb the heat. Uh, it enhances the basking effect of laying in the sun when they stretch their feet out like this. The little um, a red eft here uh, uh, down at uh, Burncoat Pond in Spencer, I added a maple seed which was nearby and it gave a very good sense of scale. These are small animals, of course. Butterflies, had a good time with butterflies. Um, Broadmeadow Brook in Worcester, I think claims the largest butterfly list of any of the Mass Audubon sanctuaries. So I think they're neck and neck with the Ipswich River. Uh, there's a big power line cut on the Broadmeadow Brook sanctuary that cuts across the Broadmeadow Brook sanctuary. And they've made an agreement with the power company to manage those, those, those open grassy areas for butterflies and wildlife. So they have the, a lot of the butterflies that occur at, at the Broadmeadow Brook are in these, this power line cut. Uh, that's a spring azure up at the uh, Wildwood Camp up in New Hampshire. Um, dragonflies and, and damselflies are really good models for the field artist. Uh, like flycatchers, they use a, a specific perch over and over again. So when they're hunting, they'll land on a little stick or a, a weed or a stalk or something, and they'll fly out to grab something to eat, and then they'll come back to that perch. And they do that again and again. So if you get your telescope, you can get your telescope on that perch. Uh, th there's a good chance that that, that, that dragonfly is going to come back and you'll have a chance to draw it and, and work, on, work on sketches. So they're really good models. Uh, they're small, difficult to locate, but because of that habit, they're, they're fun to work with. Fish are, I love working with fish. I'm, 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 I'm a, a fly fisherman myself. I enjoy fishing. Uh, so I, I really love working with fish. Uh, they're tricky though. Uh, you can sometimes get a setup where you can watch fish effectively. You have to be sort of at a high angle looking down into the water because of reflections so forth to get good views at fish. And I did get a, an opportunity like that at Eagle Lake in Holden 
where I was working along a, a raised causeway and looking down into these shallows along the causeway. And I could see these, these uh, bluegill, uh, excuse me, sorry about that, pumpkin seeds, these pumpkin seeds nesting along in these shallows along the, along the causeway. So did some drawings and took some photographs uh, and did a painting of that. A beautiful, beautiful fish, underrated fish. This is, if you know, if when you were a kid, if you went out fishing with your with mom or dad uh, for the first time and you're using bobbers and worms, there's a good chance what you caught might have been a pumpkin seed. Uh, Native brook trout, though, uh, one of the most beautiful uh, fish, I think, in the world. Uh, and this was this this uh, this pump, this uh, uh, brook trout was something that I I I, I caught uh, with my fly rod and then I photographed it and then released it and I could work at home from my from my photographs. Of course, wildflowers are wonderful models for the field artists. They don't fly away, they stay put. So they're good, so they're great in that respect, but wonderful colors and forms. So I did a lot of work with wildflowers um, at all the different sanctuaries and other plants. Uh, this, uh, this is hobble bush you see in the upper right. And I, I love those, those little orangey tan buds that they have at the tip of each twig. Uh, I, I thought it looked like a candle flame rising off, off the tip of each twig. Uh, so worked with some of the interesting uh, uh, plants at the sanctuaries as well. I worked with, um, as I mentioned earlier on the Red Sea, with some cultural and historical um, uh, buildings. Uh, this is Wachusett Meadow near me, uh, where there's some historic uh, barn, uh, barn structures and an old farmhouse there. And natural landscapes. This is Rough Meadows up in Raleigh, uh, a place where early colonists used the, the rough, um, the uh, Spartina grass for mulching. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, it, it was called rough meadow because it's very coarse grass. And I think my painting really does look like a, like a rough meadow there. So I wanna end up with a little quiz here. And uh, I, I'm gonna show you some pictures and see if you can guess where in Massachusetts uh, these, these uh, subjects were painted. And now I'm not gonna show you a picture of a blue jay and ask you what sanctuary this was painted at because you could see a blue jay at just about any sanctuary in Massachusetts. I'm, I've picked these, these images because there are, there are distinctive things about these images that will clue you into a particular location, hopefully. I know a lot of you are from Massachusetts, so hopefully you'll recognize some of these places. So this is a beautiful little building. Uh, it happens to be in, I'm going to give you some clues, this happens to be in Canton, Massachusetts. It's a building that's owned by Mass Audubon. This is the Museum of American Bird Art in Canton. Uh, this is the gallery building. There's also a big estate house that they also use for programming, and there's a lovely property as well. But this is where they have their exhibitions, their exhibitions of bird art. And if you haven't been to the Museum of American Bird Art, I hope you'll make a point to go. They put on lovely shows of, of bird art from all different uh, time periods and styles. Uh, so it's a great place. And they, of course, were the sponsor, the official sponsor of this residency project. Now, this, this is obviously a high elevation. I'm looking down onto a, a landscape. So you, you, might, you might think, well, you know, a mountainous area, maybe central Massachusetts or, you know, some in, in the central plateau or maybe in the Berkshires. But uh, if I were to take this, this, this scene here and shift it to the left over here, in fact, right about in this area right here, standing and looking off this, this viewpoint here, you would see Gillette Stadium. Gillette Stadium in Foxborough. And in fact, I was there on a cloudy or sort of a rainy afternoon pre-game time. So I could hear the loudspeakers going over there and the, the whole stadium was lit up like a big spaceship there nestled, nestled among the hills. So that should give you a good clue that this is Moose Hill in Sharon, Massachusetts. And that's painted from a place called the Bluff Overlook uh, at Moose Hill. Okay, a, a traditional New England barn in this scene. Uh, if you'll notice, there are sheep in this scene. I've already mentioned that the, some of the sanctuaries uh, have an active farm and they do have farm animals. So this is one of those. This one just happens to be very close to where I live. So that's a giveaway right there. This is the Wachusett Meadow Wildlife Sanctuary right, 
right, right in Princeton, where I live. And uh, I, uh, I hadn't done a lot of snow scenes um, for this for the residency. So when we had a, a squall, this was actually painted on the first day of spring, and we had this freak sort of heavy snowfall. So I ran down there. So that was the beauty of having a sanctuary so close by. I ran down there and, and started this painting of this the horse barn there at Wachusett Meadow in a spring snow squall. Now a forest scene, okay? This is an Atlantic white cedar forest, an Atlantic white cedar forest. These forests were very common along the New England coast years ago, uh, but unfortunately for them, uh, their wood is rot resistant and very desirable uh, for uh, various types of uh, furniture and fence posts and that type of thing. And also the land where they grow, the moist, the moist wet lands where they grow are ideal for cultivating cranberries. So there's very few of these Atlantic white cedar forests left along the New England coastline. This one happens to be on Cape Cod in Barnstable. There's a very small pocket of Atlantic white cedar forest on the Skunknet River Reserve in Barnstable. Okay, now we got some real mountains involved here. And if you're thinking Western Massachusetts this time, yes, you're right. We are in the Berkshires now in the Western mountains of Massachusetts. In fact, this was painted in the extreme southwest corner of Massachusetts. Some of you may have been to a trustee's property called Bartholomew's Cobble, which is quite close by to this, to this sanctuary. Uh, this, this is uh, the Lime Kilt Farm Sanctuary in Sheffield, Massachusetts. And you're looking, uh, you're looking over, the, uh, over the border into New York from this viewpoint here. And it's called the Taconic Vista Trail because you're getting a good view of the Taconic Mountains in New York from this viewpoint. These are some of the uh, Southern Berkshires that you're seeing, some of the, uh, the hills of the Southern Berkshires coming in on the right. Okay, a large uh, grassland, a large grassland. I've already talked about how grasslands have, have been diminishing in Massachusetts. They've been taken over by development or forests. So they're not, there are not a lot of large extensive grasslands left in Massachusetts. There's some big ones out near Pease Air Force Base out in uh, Chicopee. Uh, there, are, there are grasslands here and there, but, but, there's, but there's not very many big ones left. Uh, this one, however, is right in Eastern Massachusetts. And this is the Daniel Webster a wildlife sanctuary in Marshfield, Massachusetts, a large extensive grassland and of course all those accompanying very special plants and animals that you associate with a grassland to be found here. This was painted in early November and that explains these sort of autumnal colors that you see uh, on these rolling, these gently rolling hills and that's a little clue in itself. Uh, that's a sandy track there going through these gently, gently rolling hills. And you've probably uh, guessed that this is on one of our offshore islands, uh, either Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard. Uh, that's a merlin flying by. Uh, and I indeed saw these birds when I was working uh, on Nantucket at the Sacagawea Heathlands. I had to ask them, how do you say this word here? You know, it's an, it's a, it's an Indian word. And uh, the, um, the person running the sanctuary there said, well, just think of it as a sneeze, Sacagawea. So that's how I'm saying it. I don't know if I got it right, but that's how, <laughs> that's how I learned to say the word. You might recognize the profile of this mountain range. Uh, this is, uh, um, this is, but you, you also want to notice that, yes, there's a mountain range here, but there's also agricultural fields here, low, flat agricultural fields. Uh, well, this is along the Connecticut River, the largest river that runs through Massachusetts. This is, um, this is in the Connecticut River Valley. And that mountain range that you see there is Mount Tom, Mount Tom. Uh, and just beyond Mount Tom, you know, just over that mountain is, is the Connecticut River. So there's a lot of low-lying areas and, and a very rich agricultural land along the river and this, this one mountain range of Mount Tom that you can view from the Acadia Wildlife Sanctuary in East Hampton. 
And once again, a, a, a coastal scene, I hope you pick up on that. This is a river delta. This is an area where a river flows into a marsh and then into the ocean. Uh, and you get a good view of this. I don't, I hope the, I hope the view is still as nice as it used to be. These, these views can grow up in trees and so forth. But on Route 3A heading south uh, through this area, you've got a good view of this. Uh, this is in, again in Marshfield, Massachusetts. Uh, this is the north, where the North River uh, drains into this marsh and into the ocean. Uh, and the sanctuary is called the North River Sanctuary in Marshfield. Okay, we're back in the mountains here now. Uh, you see some, some hills there and some mountains. I'm obviously painted this from a high viewpoint, looking down into a valley. Okay, this is, this, as I said, Western Massachusetts. I'm in the Berkshires again. And what I'm seeing as I look down into this, this valley is the Housatonic River Valley. That's the other major river west of the Connecticut River. Uh, and in, nestled in the Housatonic Valley is the, town, the lovely town of Lenox. So that's what you're seeing spread out below me here. Uh, this is a view from, from Lenox Mountain. And Lenox Mountain, part of Lenox Mountain, is, uh, the, uh, is, is the Pleasant Valley Wildlife Sanctuary owned by Mass Audubon. So you can take trails within the sanctuary right up to the top of Lenox Mountain and get, get some of these views. So it's a very stiff climb too. It's a great climb. Also the highest elevation uh, of any, any wildlife sanctuary, of Mass Audubon Sanctuary in, uh, in Massachusetts. This is a view that could be in a lot of places. I, you know, I debated whether I should put this one in, but there's a good reason why I put this one in. Uh, this is a, a, you know, a freshwater wetland. It's actually a river, a large river. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, scene of the, uh, the, the, the newest property owned by Mass Audubon. It's not yet open to the public. This will be a wildlife sanctuary uh, developed by Mass Audubon. And it's, uh, it's located right on the Concord River in Concord, Massachusetts. In fact, this, this opposite bank that you see when you look across the river is the Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge which I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So Mass Audubon, because of some generous donors, has acquired this property. And this property uh, was, uh, years, years ago, was owned by the very first president of Mass Audubon. His name was William Brewster, and he was an, a prominent ornithologist of, of his day. And he bought a lot of property along the river here. And then it was sold to various individuals. You know, he passed away. Uh, and then some of these some of these landowners got together and, and, and decided to donate the land back to Mass Audubon. So it has a very rich history closely linked to the Massachusetts Audubon Society. And it's really exciting that Mass Audubon has been able to add this new property. I want to finish up with just a few uh, birds here because these are uh, species which only occur on one Mass Audubon sanctuary. These are uh, the, these birds nest on only one Mass Audubon sanctuary. This is a white-eyed vireo uh, in in breeding, full breeding plumage, and nesting in this location. And there's only one sanctuary where you can find nesting white-eyed vireos, and that is down at Allen's Pond in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. One of my favorite sanctuaries, by the way, beautiful diversity of habitats. Uh, but they, they have these, these lovely vireo. This is a vireo, one of several species of vireos. It's a more southerly nesting vireo. And this is one of the few places uh, uh, in Massachusetts where it breeds. You can find it in a few other places in Massachusetts, but they're not on a Mass Audubon sanctuary. This is an unusual gull. This is what we, what the birders would call a white-winged gull. Okay, so these less common gulls, and one of the places where birders go to see uh, these these uh, less common gulls is up on the north shore of Massachusetts, uh, in the, off the town of Gloucester, Massachusetts. In winter time, you can often go to go to these to this place and see these uh, these uh, less less common gulls. This is at Eastern Point Wildlife Sanctuary uh, in Gloucester. And this is a subadult Iceland gull, very pretty gull. And then finally, there's only one Mass Audubon Sanctuary where you can see a bald eagle on its nest. 
Uh, now there are other there are other places in Massachusetts where you can see a bald eagle on a nest. However, this is the only uh, Mass Audubon sanctuary that has a bald eagle on a nest. And uh, if you think about where they like to nest, they like to nest along in coastal areas or, or, or along large rivers. They, they eat a lot of uh, fish. They're kind of a scavenger by nature. So this is along the Connecticut River. Uh, and this is the Acadia Wildlife Sanctuary in East Hampton. So we did have a, uh, as a sort of a wrap up, we did have an exhibition of all the, the paintings I did for the project at the, at the uh, Canton Museum in Canton. This was in September of 2017. And uh, this is sort of a wrap up here of what I achieved during the project. Of course, it started off small and as I added more and more sanctuaries, I ended up doing 61 wildlife sanctuaries and it took me four and a half years to complete the entire project. And some of the statistics there that you can see. It's now a book as well, which I'm sure that Robert has already talked about. You can get this book from Mass Audubon. It's now in its second printing. It's done very well. Uh, and it was a labor of love for me, as you can imagine. Um, and all the paintings you see on, in the program here are from, are from the book. So um, I hope this inspires you to go out. Uh, I know a lot of you live in Massachusetts. I'm sure you've probably been to some of the Mass Audubon sanctuaries in your area but I hope this inspires you to maybe go a little further uh, into some of the areas, so other areas of Massachusetts and explore some of these wonderful properties that Mass Audubon operates. There's so much to see and do on these properties. So thank you for listening. I've, in, I've enjoyed doing the talk tonight. A very wonderful presentation. Uh, let's take uh, approximately seven minutes worth of questions here. I did want to read this one comment that I thought encapsulated a lot of other comments we got. Uh, this comes from an anonymous attendee who writes, just wanted to say thank you. Your paintings are beautiful and it was interesting to learn about the process of how, your work, uh, how you work. It's been, uh, I've been looking for somewhere to experience more nature and plan on looking at a mass Audubon site near me, which I wasn't aware of until your presentation. So I thought Excellent. that was wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. I love to hear that. You bet. You bet. All right. Margo asks, how important is it to know anatomy in doing your work? Oh, absolutely. Anatomy, bird anatomy is I know best because that's my favorite subject. One of the first things I had to do when I was learning to draw birds uh, in, uh, you know, starting to draw them in the wild and or trying to draw birds in any form is I had to learn about how they were put together, you know, uh, how their bones move and so forth, how it compares to the human anatomy. So I got a, 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 a college textbook on ornithology and studied it. I went to some museums and studied skeletons, looked at the way the bird's bones were put together and the way their muscles uh, manipulated the various parts. So that was really important. And I carry that little blueprint around in my head. And it's invaluable when I'm drawing birds in the field, because I know that basic anatomy and how they're put together. So yes, absolutely. Very, very important aspect. Uh, Pamela asks, what projects are you working on now? And are you planning another book? Hint, hint, that book on sketching your field sketches. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I would like to do a book about, um, uh, about a more book that's almost completely art oriented. As you can see, I was trained as an artist. Uh, and uh, it's very important to me to, uh, um, uh, to, have, to have learned and developed the skills as an artist. And I'd like to pass that along in book form. So I would like to do a, a book about art. Right now I have a, um, uh, I should mention, I have a show at the Fruitlands Museum in Harvard, Massachusetts, and it features some of the paintings you saw here tonight. So I'm gonna be exhibiting some of these works around the state, um, but I, I am, I'm on the lookout for other residency projects. I'm enjoying taking a little break because now I can paint whatever I want. I don't have to necessarily go to a, a mass Audubon sanctuary, but I would like to get involved in some other residencies too. Uh, the trustees have some wonderful properties around the state and that would be, that would be really lots of fun to enjoy some, to, to explore some of those properties. Oops, I've lost you. I can't, I can't. Can't hear you, Robert. I can't hear Robert for some reason. I've lost him.
Robert, do you have any other additional questions? <laughs> okay, I don't know if you people can still hear me, but I've certainly enjoyed doing this program tonight. And uh, I thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to, uh, to watch, watch my presentation. And I think we're, uh, I think, I think we're ready to wrap it up. So uh, enjoy the holidays, everyone, and uh, hopefully we'll meet someday. Okay, thank you, folks. Good night now.